So to end it all, we're going to end with a great talk with two first timers. And when you guys give him a big hand. Um, and their name is Stevie and Nick. And the talk is called Let Smart Screen More Caffeine, which is the best thing ever, more coffee. Uh, <laughs> click once, abuse for trusted co-execution. So uh, uh, actually, um, cheers for these guys and cheers for everybody who are having a great con. And uh, let's kick it off with these guys. We didn't do it, whatever, it's fine. All right, just go ahead and get... Oh, oh wait, sorry. <laughs> I made a mistake. So since it's our first time at the con, we were a tradition of doing some shots, to, like to basically cool them down. So here we are. Steve, Nick, Dushan. Because everyone's nervous. <laughs> you know, it's only live streamed and all that fun stuff. Thank you so much. There you go. Cheers. 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 Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Hey, so yeah, we'll be talking about uh, some click once techniques. We'll start off with some intros. My name is Nick Powers. Uh, I'm currently a senior consultant at Spectre Ops. Uh, my interests include uh, Windows stuff, uh, initial access, uh, some relay attacks, and my handle on Twitter is Energy. My name is Steven. I'm also a senior consultant on the ads team at Spectre Ops. Uh, you can follow me at 0x13 if you want to see more. So what we look to accomplish today, uh, we want to take a relatively common uh, initial access technique and extend its value for offensive use by abusing the uh, trust of third party applications. So a little overview of what we're going to cover today. Give a little background of click once. I'm not sure if everyone uh, knows exactly click once or how it works, uh, but we'll cover that. Uh, we'll talk about pressure points of uh, building click once applications for uh, weaponization of uh, initial or offensive operations, how we can alleviate those pressure points, uh, actually showing weaponization, and then we'll close it off with some d uh, detection and response overviews. So a little bit of background. Uh, initial access techniques are decreasing. Uh, recently Microsoft came out and said uh, by default in Office macros they're going to start um, disabling them when it's downloaded from the internet. It's reversed, then it got re reversed back. Uh, so at this case, or at this point, we're not quite sure where that is, but there is a lot of scrutiny that's applied to office macros, um, whether it be applied for uh, phishing campaigns or seated access, what have you. Uh, and so this is just a way uh, for more uh, techniques to be leveraged uh, for initial access campaigns. Uh, some of the things that we have to worry about uh, for uh, initial access campaigns, obviously we got smart screen, any sort of application control, uh, EDR, things like that that run on endpoints, definitely things that increased our barrier to entry uh, for uh, initial access. Some things that we need to overcome. So we need to make sure that we can install or execute code that does not require any sort of privileges, or sorry, administrative privileges. Uh, reputable, known good files during execution definitely helps us during this um, process. Uh, streamlined, minimal user interaction. The more things that people have to do during phishing campaigns or initial access operations uh, definitely or decrease our chances of being successful. And then we want ease of re-rolling uh, our techniques uh, over and over. So click once, again, uh, click once is a deployment technology that enables you to create self-updating Windows-based applications that can be installed and run with minimal user interaction. Uh, so this is a vehicle for installing or executing .NET applications on endpoints. And so there's um, multiple different ways that click once can be deployed, can be installed on endpoints. The main thing that we'll be focusing on today are web applications or websites that we can um, get these installed. Uh, but the main thing that we'll need to focus on and will be important throughout this talk are manifests. Now, anyone that's done any sort of manifest or .NET stuff uh, or um, .NET um, work uh, might be familiar with manifest and so we'll be talking about that uh, throughout this entire slide deck. But plenty of legitimate applications use click once for their vehicles of deploying their code. So Chrome historically uh, used to use click once, uh, Fidelity, the bank uses click once and tons of other ones you probably have never heard of, but they also use click once. So again, as I said, manifests are very important. And so we'll talk about the different types of manifests that come into play with click once and what their roles are with them. 
so the first one that we need to think about is a deployment manifest. Uh, and so this is going to be named a dot application file. So when you go to a website, the first thing that you interact with the click once application is going to be a dot application file, which again is the deployment manifest. Now this is going to reference the actual application manifest. Uh, and inside of this, we have uh, some identity information uh, and um, things along those lines. In addition to uh, interacting with deployment manifests, we also have app ref, app ref MS files, which we won't talk about too much in this talk, but they are usable uh, for click once applications. Uh, the second app manifest that I just mentioned, application manifest, is the second uh, manifest that we have to deal with when dealing with click once applications. Uh, and this is a dot manifest file. And so this will specify uh, dependencies, again, as I said, identities inside the files, and everything that needs, needs to be uh, downloaded and deployed alongside that click once application. Uh, the identity information is going to come into play as a very important role, which we'll cover later on toward the end of this uh, presentation, but something just to keep in mind in the back of your head right now. Everything that we put inside of the actual application manifest uh, will have identity or uh, integrity checks, but we can have some uh, workarounds with those uh, that we'll cover later on as well. And then inside of uh, the actual .NET applications themselves, we also have embedded application manifest and embedded assembly manifests. And so these are different, but they look somewhat similar to how a uh, click once application works, but this is just something that's just a component of .NET itself. But again, these have uh, various factors that are important. So this is what a click once application looks like. We have our uh, deployment manifest, our application manifest, and then our actual .NET um, .exe .deploy. Uh, they can be named .deploy for the extension, but they don't have to be. But typically, typically in like legitimate click once applications, we'll see uh, they are named .deploy. Oops. Uh, sorry. Okay, so click once applications are deployed, as I said, visiting the deployment manifest. So if you visit some uh, click once or a deployment manifest in something like Edge or Internet Explorer, uh, you'll see a little pop up show up says, oh, do you want to run this and get the execution that happens along with that, which we'll show in a demo later on. Uh, alternatively, as I said, there is an app ref MS file, which can be used when you're dealing with uh, Firefox or Chrome browsers as well. Uh, this serves content um, based on whatever the application manifest specifies and will be downloaded via HTTP or HTTPS uh, to the host system and will be saved in the app uh, data local directory in a randomized uh, directory but all in like the same naming convention of apps 2.0 and stuff like that. The process is that will launch everything, handle the download, the execution and the launching of everything is called DFSVC which is a part of the .NET framework. And so the main thing that DFSVC is doing is going to be loading this system.deployment DLL, again, part of the .NET framework, that will be uh, handling pretty much every component of click once. So uh, we, we have here our HTML. This is just an uh, example of what the download looks like. We have our deployment uh, manifest, and it's going to hit all of our uh, dep dependencies in the main click once application and download everything and get it onto the host. This is just a simple example of what our app ref MS file looks like. Uh, this is just shows the location of where the click once application is, calls the click once protocol handler, and then specifies uh, some additional .NET information that's necessary. This is what an example of a deployment manifest, what it looks like. Uh, we're referencing the application manifest, as I said, part of here, and this is, will uh, determine where to download all the rest of the dependencies and the actual click once application itself. Uh, and then also, also we have the assembly identity as well, which is important later on. Example of what the application manifest of click once looks like. Uh, we just have UAC information, identity information, uh, we have some dependency information, everything that needs to be downloaded as well, uh, and everything that comes along with the entire package. This is an example of what the embedded application manifest looks like. Uh, and so we have, you know, again, more identity information. This is actually just .NET applications themselves. So this is what they will be built with uh, and this is contained in almost all uh, applications. Example of what an assembly manifest looks like. Uh, this will reference mainly the dependencies that go along with a click once application. Uh, this is what it looks like in DNSPY. A little bit cleaner than uh, the last screenshot from ILDASM, uh, but that's just showing the difference of what is uh, shown there. 
So the reason that we'll be talk covering through this talk of why these are important is that they are going to be parsed by the system.deployment DLL functionality and they're going to be make some comparison checks for the actual execution uh, but this is kind of showing an example of where that is like essentially being applied and parsed and uh, handled. So we're going to show uh, a demo that's going to show what if you were to build a click once application right now uh, and you, it's not signed, you don't have a code signing cert uh, and what this would look like from uh, execution standard. This is, yeah. All right. So we'll go to our site, index.html for the site. We have our download which is going to be where our deployment manifest is located. Click download. There's a little pop up that says do you want to run this? Say yes. We have our little run dialog. Click run, downloads, and we have our smart screen pop up show up. So, from a phishing campaign or initial access operation, this is not what we want to see. We have hurdles to come through here now that we have this application that's not trusted, no reputation, nothing behind it. We go and look at it, look at the application, open it up, we'll see. Look at the signature. This is just self signed, nothing special here. But there was something that we had to, some hoops that we had to jump through. Awesome. So, Stephen just gave us a really good overview of what uh, Click Once looks like in its current state when we want to weaponize that for something, some sort of initial access, phishing or otherwise. Uh, so, to start working towards some of the problems that we want to address, uh, we got a screenshot here. This is from the Bloodhound Gang Slack, specifically the Red Team channel. Uh, and there's a long message here at the top. Uh, the summary is uh, someone is asking about using Click Once for initial access. And if you look at the response second from the bottom, it reads, if you have a cert, then I would 100% recommend looking into Click Once, one of the best initial access techniques, but you really need a cert for this to be effective. And it's in its current state, how people currently use this for initial access, for example, uh, we definitely agreed with that sentiment. Uh, so what are some of these pressure points with the way click once deployment currently works? Uh, well the first one is smart screen. You saw in the demo that Steven just did for us that there was a big uh, somewhat obnoxious blue box that popped up. You have to click more info to even be given the option to run anyways and then we get our code execution. Uh, to give a little background on what smart screen actually consists of, uh, it's a reputation based protection. Uh, it's, it first appeared in Windows 8.1 and above. Uh, that reputation is based on either the file hash, so like the file that you're sending for your initial access attempt, there'll be a hash like the, the checksum associated with that. It could be associated with the signature that signed the assembly. It could also be associated with the URL that uh, your potential victim grabbed the assembly from. Uh, one thing that I like to note, and I'll say this a couple more times during the presentation, just to kind of compare and contrast what we're presenting with uh, alternatives, is an EV code signing certificate, for example, would also get rid of the smart screen prompt. Uh, but there's a lot of pros and cons associated with this as well. Uh, but um, there are two separate types of code signing certs. I'll talk about it here in the next slide. Is uh, there's authentic code, but EV code signing is the only one that will give that immediate smart screen reputation. So. Uh, without code signing certificates, uh, like Steven just so showed us, ultimately uh, what we'll end up executing is, uh, is an unsigned assembly uh, for this click once deployment. What does that mean? We'll trigger smart screen like we just saw. Uh, it means things like uh, mark of the web will be associated with the assembly that we've downloaded. That's what ends up triggering smart screen. This could also be a reason for EDR products or AV to pay closer attention to the assembly being downloaded. Uh, as well as uh, you could fall victim to solutions like app control or uh, whitelisting prevention uh, because the assembly that would be downloaded is unsigned. It might not execute for those reasons. Uh, so continuing on with some of these pressure points, uh, generally click once is less used we think than uh, for example office documents. Uh, our assumption for that is that the internals have been less explored up to this point generally. Uh, people might assume that it's harder to, uh, to put together one of these deployments to deliver like an initial access payload during a phishing campaign. Uh, the manifest information has to be accurate for a deployment to work which can be another uh, kind of pain. Uh, Steven mentioned a lot of manifests. We'll, we'll dig in a little bit more here in a second but uh, he already mentioned and I'll kind of reiterate now that um, all of these manifest values need to match up for this deployment to be successful and we'll step through that in a little bit. Uh, the code signature is needed uh, 
potentially needed for higher success rates during things like uh, phishing campaigns. Again, the EV signature can guarantee that, but EV code signing certs are really, really tough to get. Uh, alternatively, you could, you could sign with an authentic code certificate, uh, and that certificate won't give you the immediate reputation, but it could itself build up reputation over time. And then once that authentic code certificate has built up reputation, everything you sign with it will have reputation with smart screen. Uh, also, if you're going to code sign to get around things like smart screen, uh, there's considerations such as attribution for your payload. So like the assessments that we're doing, if we start signing our payloads, we could sign a payload for an assessment we did two years ago for a customer and then somebody could, like somebody in the threat intel community could tweet that and then virus total would just show you all of the payloads that we've been developing over the last two years. So that's a concern for us on the offensive side. Uh, as well as it's just complicated to obtain, it can be complicated to obtain something like an EV cert. There's a strict vetting process, they cost a lot of money, uh, so there's a lot of pros and cons to consider. So the question that we pose at this point is, uh, so like what can we do to alleviate these pressure points and not have to obtain one of these code signing certs? Uh, so we're, we're kind of going to approach this with uh, two somewhat unique techniques, but the first one is going to be uh, there's all of these click once deployments out there that are already signed. Uh, so why wouldn't we just find a way to sideload one of those existing and trusted click once deployments? Uh, so the way that we'll approach this in the, in the upcoming slides is that we'll search around uh, through dorks and other methods for other people's signed, trusted, and already published on the internet click once deployments. So we can use those uh, as, a, as a method of sideloading and ultimately end up with trusted code execution. Uh, so we're gonna, one thing that we wanna note uh, before we start talking about backdooring existing click once deployments is that when we backdoor these existing deployments, we're not backdooring like the assembly that's gonna ultimately run our malicious code. We're gonna backdoor a dependency, so like a DLL, or there's a bunch of other techniques that we can use, but the point that we wanna stress is that the, assemble, the deployment that we're backdooring, we're going to backdoor a dependency, therefore we will not break the signature of that host assembly. So we'll still have the reputation in regards to smart screen, the potential benefit when it comes to EDR, et cetera. There's a lot of useful tools that we can use to do this, DNSpy, ResHacker, uh, Mage, SigChecker, we'll talk about several of these throughout the presentation. So the first step that we want to uh, go through uh, is identify uh, an existing and signed click once deployment. Uh, so this is an example of what downloading a uh, fully signed and uh, usable click once deployment looks like. On the right here we have, uh, we're actually going through Google, looking through a dork to identify uh, published click once applications. So once we've gone through that process of go doing our Googling, looking around, we've identified uh, signed click once applications. So what do we do now? Well now we're going to hijack the execution flow of that click once application. So we're going to download that signed application, decompile it, since it is .NET, it's e very easy to do when you use something like DNSpy, understand the execution flow of where all the components are and how it works, find a dependency that is not strongly named, and then go into that dependency or that DLL backdoor it, um, so we'll put our uh, code, whatever malicious code that we want to write, put it inside of that .NET. Uh, we can also do traditional DLL search order hijacking here as well. Uh, but once we've put our code into that DLL, we'll go ahead and uh, build a manifest that reflect the changes that we've made and then recompile everything and host it and have it ready to be deployed. Alternatively, if we don't want to backdoor a dependency, we can do app domain injection, uh, which will allow us to load a DLL based on a config file for uh, .NET, or, and we also can get creative with that too if we want to do any sort of uh, Node.Jade uh, weaponization or uh, net .NET deserialization, we can so that we're not just running straight up shell code and calling commonly um, abused uh, Win32 APIs. So going through the process, we identify our ClickMuts application, we download it, we look at it has a valid signature, so this is a prime example or a prime uh, opportunity for us to weaponize this. We look through the actual references, uh, dependencies that this would use, look for anything that has the public key token of null, which means it's not strongly named. 
go through the code. So we want to find somewhere that we can get our code typically executed early on. And then we'll go, um, pretty much it's going to happen at the entry point, look through um, kind of the, where everything happens. We find something here. The DPI settings has a method called set DPI awareness. So we'll go into that look into there, not strongly named, so this is a prime location for us to put our code inside of it and um, get our execution in a signed process. So we have our notepad.exe we're calling and then a, a pop-up box that we're going to execute. Okay, so uh, we covered, Stephen gave us a, a quick overview of what Click once currently looks like to weaponize, and we've started getting into backdooring click one, existing click once deployments. But uh, uh, Stevens made several references to manifests, and manipulating these manifests will be relevant to us being able to weaponize uh, what we're talking about in terms of uh, like backdooring other people's click once deployments. So uh, Stephen just walked us through uh, putting some of our potentially malicious code inside, of adding that to a DLL, a, a dependency of the deployment and then uh, executing to get that code execution. The last thing we'll have to do to make this deployment work is, like he said, uh, change some of these values in the manifest so the deployment will execute successfully. Uh, so the first thing to note here is that uh, there are several fields within the click once manifest that are optional. Uh, the things that will very likely prevent successful execution of a click once deployment uh, would be, for example, the public key token values, the hash block. These are all things that when you're executing the click once deployment, they're like integrity checks. And you can probably imagine because we've modified at least one of the dependencies, we've changed the ultimate checksum or the hash associated with that DLL. It's changed, so we need to either change or remove these values from the manifest. And thankfully, a lot of these values that are checking that integrity of the deployment are optional. So we can just remove them or we can replace them with all zeros and null them out and it won't be checked. Uh, and also, additionally, if we wanted to do things like app domain manager injection, uh, we could use the file XML block to add more dependencies to this click once deployment. One thing that we wanted to note because we're talking a lot about uh, integrity checking and signatures here is that you can imagine if we're modifying someone else's existing click once deployment to get the benefit of their uh, signed executable, then when we modify the manifest, the manifests are also signed. So when we have to change these values, we will break the signature of the manifest. That's something that we wanted to note. Uh, but ultimately, we think this is uh, okay in our opinion because we'll show on the next slide here in a second what the difference in the pop up block, the pop up boxes are, and it's. Uh, in our opinion, significantly less intrusive than like the smart screen, big obnoxious, click the more info, click run anyways thing. So this is the difference if we break the signature associated with a manifest. Uh, just to kind of reiterate, a lot of, uh, a lot of very popular click once deployments out there don't even have signed manifests, so it's going to be the box on the left anyways, the little red X in the right. Even if it is signed with a trusted code signing certificate, uh, the only difference is that uh, kind of like yellow explanation point and uh, not a huge difference when we break the manifest associated with a click once deployment here. So some of the code signing impl implications associated with click once deployment abuse. Uh, the question we're posing here is do we really need a code signing cert to effectively weaponize click once? Uh, like we just showed, the difference in the prompt here is uh, relatively minimal, especially when we compare that to how uh, kind of intrusive the smart screen prompt could be. Uh, again, uh, we have the option of going out and paying a lot of money and going through a relatively strict vetting process if we wanted to pursue an EV code signing cert, for example, or maybe even authentic code. Uh, but there's pros and cons associated with that as well. The vetting process is strict, like we said, uh, but uh, there's no need when sideloading a signed reputable assembly uh, with the code signing certificates. So yeah, kind of like we said, uh, we see a lot more benefit in just abusing some sort of sideloading technique than going through that uh, long, some somewhat intrusive vetting process for an EV code signing cert and paying a lot of money. So we'll have uh, another quick demo here to uh, the first demo was Steven showing what click once looked like initially and this will show what the process looks like when we execute a click once deployment but we've side loaded somebody else's signed code. 
uh, we go back to our, uh, the same website here, uh, you'll see again a very similar deployment manifest. Uh, the same prompt here, we're just going to say open. And then uh, that prompt, but you'll notice uh, when all of our dependencies download here, now there's no uh, smart screen prompt. We just get our code execution. And just to kind of prove why that's the case, uh, we'll go over to the assembly that we, uh, or the deployment that we decided to sideload, and we'll show that it is, in fact, signed by uh, uh, code, uh, legitimate code signing certificate. Okay, so uh, just to kind of recap, we've covered what ClickOne's deployments look like in their current state. Then we kind of pose the question of uh, why not just sideload uh, other people's existing and potentially trusted click once deployments. Uh, but the other technique that we kind of wanted to go over was if we could take that a step further. Uh, and the reason we, the reason we wanted to do this in the first place is if, uh, if you go out looking on like using Google dorks or other resources, there's a finite number of existing click once deployments published on the internet. It's not necessarily the most popular vehicle for installing .NET. So there's only a specific number of those available. Uh, and so we wanted to take it a step further and be able to take arbitrary .NET assemblies that are signed uh, and trusted and be able to create our own click once deployments around those uh, trusted or around those signed .NET assemblies. Be mostly because that would vastly increase the amount of assemblies that we could sideload and use for initial access or whatever we wanted. So we'll take the uh, regular .NET assembly, uh, but we can't just take any .NET assembly uh, to abuse for this use case. There's a couple prerequisites that we found that you have to meet that the assembly itself has to meet. Uh, one of which is that the default embedded application manifest identity needs to not exist. Uh, we'll show exactly what that looks like in a second, but Stephen mentioned earlier there's uh, the concept of embedded manifests, the manifest that is embedded within the assembly itself. There's a line in all the XML that you saw earlier. One of them says uh, assembly identity. That line needs to not exist for this to work. Uh, the requested privileges line needs to be set to as invoker or it needs to not exist. So basically the requested privileges line in that uh, embedded manifests, it's going to say like do you need to run as admin, can you run as a regular user. If it's set to um, require administrator or there's one more that's higher than that that we'll show in a second, it won't work with this technique. If it's set to as invoker or it doesn't exist, it will work for this technique. Uh, so other than those prereq prerequisite checks, uh, everything else is going to be the same to what we just went through. We're just going to sideload a signed.NET assembly and end up with more trusted code execution. So this is something that we wanted to note uh, just uh, like with a lot of other things, there are potentially, uh, potentially some inaccuracies associated with like MSDN documentation. This is one that we found while we were reversing uh, one of the DLLs associated with ClickOnce that Steven will talk about in a second. But uh, this particularly says um, basically if a .NET assembly has an embedded manifest, you need to recompile it to not include an embedded manifest for it to work with click once. We actually found that that wasn't the case. It can include UAC information as long as it's set to as invoker. It just can't require admin. Uh, so this is uh, when we were digging through the system deployment DLL, which is where, again, most of the uh, click once deployment functionality exists. You can see here, this is just us dropping that DLL in DNSPY, and you'll see uh, maybe like five or six lines down, down, it might be hard to see, but you can see, uh, I'm sorry, actually, the, the if statement here, you'll see the keyword require administrator. The DLL is just doing some checks against that manifest that we just talk, talked about, and if it is require, if it requires administrator, it says, for this deployment to fail. So uh, a couple inaccuracies in the MSDN documentation that we found. Uh, so this is a comparison of a default.NET assembly you'll see at the top. And uh, a second ago I mentioned the assembly identity line. Uh, that's also very important for what we're talking about here. That needs to not exist. So just as reference, that top box that is an embedded an embedded manifest that will not work for what we're talking about. The bottom one you'll notice is a non-standard embedded manifest that we found and this is actually assigned uh, Microsoft assembly. 
signed by Microsoft uh, Trusted Assembly, and it does not include that assembly identity line, so it will work with this technique. Uh, so we spent a lot of time going through the uh, system deployment DLL uh, to figure out like why deployments would fail or why they would work. Uh, and Steven actually did a lot of the heavy lifting on that, so I'll let him talk about some of this reversing. Yeah, so uh, in this top uh, screenshot here, uh, we have the assembly identity that is part of the application deployment man or like the click once application manifest. And so one of the fields in there is going to be the processor architecture, which is something that is required for us to have inside of the assembly identity for the deployment. Uh, in the bottom screenshot, we have the comparison if that assembly identity is in the um, embedded application manifest, then uh, typically by default it was not built with that or is not compiled with that information. So it does a check between these two values and the ultimate reason is that there is no uh, processor architecture that it has to be specified um, in or inside of the embedded application manifest. So while we can try to get it to match, it will never match. So it pr essentially prevents us from being able to load just any .NET assembly that we want in a click once application. Uh, it's only limited to any that meet this particular uh, reason. But at the bottom you'll see uh, the bottom line is going to be the click once application manifest and top line is going to be the embedded application manifest. And here's just some documentation to back up what Steven just said. It shows that uh, in the manifest that we're talking about, the processor architecture field of that uh, particular block will be required, and that's why this particular prereq exists for the technique that we're discussing. So uh, just to kind of recap about the difference between uh, the, the techniques that we're talking about, first we talked about sideloading somebody else's click once deployment, find it online, download it, sideloaded dependency. Now we've just gone over the fact that uh, there is a way to actually use an arbitrary .NET assembly that's signed and wrap a click once deployment around it and use that uh, for what we're talking about. But if we, if, we, if we decide to do that, we'll need to create our manifests from scratch because we don't have somebody else's to just go off and tweak and then redeploy. Uh, so this is actually super easy because uh, in the Windows 10 SDK, uh, there is a, there's an assembly called mage.exe and what mage.exe is, uh, it's defined as the manifest generation and editing tool, a uh, command line tool that supports the creation and editing of application and deployment manifests. Uh, so I included some one liners here, uh, like Steven mentioned a couple times we'll need our application and our deployment manifests and that's essentially it. We run two one liners with mage.exe, we've created our uh, two manifests that we need for this click once deployment. Uh, and then we should have what we need uh, to create a weaponized click once deployment. And again, we noted earlier, but it's probably worth noting again, uh, when you create these manifests with mage.exe, it will automatically calculate some of those like integrity check, uh, like hash values. Uh, several of those are optional. The public key token value can be nulled out with 16 zeros. The hash blocks associated with all of the files and their dependencies can just be removed. They're optional. Uh, so uh, if you don't remove those or recalculate them, it can cause a deployment to fail. So that's why we like to reiterate. And so now we'll do, uh, we'll do a demo of us, instead of sideloading somebody else's existing deployment, we took an arbitrary Microsoft signed .NET assembly, we wrapped, wrapped it with some manifests that we created and because it meets, uh, because it is, it checks off these boxes, it, it meets these prerequisites that we found. Uh, we can weaponize it uh, using click once. So you see we start off here the same way we started in the other demos. We go to our website, uh, we reference our deployment manifest, we start the download process. Uh, we click run. Again, you'll notice here uh, we were not prompted with smart screen. That's because we're using uh, sign.net assembly in this context. Uh, you can see the, the notepad prompt in the code that Stephen referenced earlier. So this shows that our code successfully executed. But the interesting part it here is that before you saw we were just running in the context of some person's signed assembly. Uh, this time you'll notice that this is signed by Microsoft, uh, an assembly that we found uh, of theirs. Uh, it's a part of the Azure SDK to be a little more specific. Uh, but now we were able to, like we just said, create our own click once uh, manifests using mage.exe, wrap it around this assembly that we found that met meets these prereqs 
and ultimately sideload it and execute our malicious code in the context of this Microsoft signed assembly. And then lastly, just like before, uh, we'll go to the folder to show what was actually downloaded, click properties, uh, we'll check the signatures, and it shows that it, it's signed with a, uh, with a valid uh, Microsoft code signing certificate. Okay, so we, we've gone over uh, two techniques that we can use to ultimately achieve more trusted code execution using click once. Uh, but we wanted to help expedite this process, so uh, we will be releasing two tools. Uh, one is Assembly Hunter that Steven will talk about in a second. Uh, the other is Click Once Hunter. Uh, so Click Once Hunter, essentially what it does is it's just going to help expedite some of the dorking process that I mentioned earlier. So uh, you can use your favorite search engine, you can use GitHub, uh, we'll reference a few in a second, but uh, Click Once Hunter specifically will use like uh, Chrome Headless, Chrome Dev Tools, and also incorporate some uh, API gateway functionality to uh, rotate your source IP address, get around some of that rate limiting, and uh, speed up the dorking process so you can find some of these existing uh, click once deployments to sideload yourself. Uh, we'll, uh, Steven will also be re releasing Click Hunter very soon. Uh, that's going to do a lot of I'm sorry, <laughs> Assembly Hunter very soon. And it will uh, do a lot of really cool things. Um, uh, some, it'll triage the local file system and do a lot of these prereq checks for you. So you can search uh, a local file system and find if uh, any assemblies that are there locally would work for some of the techniques that we've talked about. So this is just a quick example of using uh, Shodan. Uh, you can use this particular keyword. There's a, a a huge list of other dorks that you could use as well, but this shows some existing potentially signed and trusted click once deployments that exist. Uh, here's another example of using some Bing specific dorks that uh, you can see like 11,000 results, so there's a lot out there for people to find and uh, potentially weaponize. Uh, here's using uh, GitHub uh, with some specific keywords again, and uh, this time we were searching the values in the embedded uh, embedded manifest to see if it would meet some of these prerequisites that we've talked about. And uh, here's another project on GitHub that uh, shows a, a manifest that will be embedded that will very likely meet our prerequisites to sideload this as a weaponized click once deployment. And this is what the output of the tool looked like. It's just going to give a list to the uh, deployments online that you can go download the de deployment and start to sideload with whatever you want to sideload with. So this is an example of what uh, Assembly Hunter looks like. Uh, you can see we can triage entire paths, single files, collections, services, tasks. Clearly, I think anyone, uh, you look at this and it can do a lot more than just look at uh, click once abusable techniques. I'll let you figure that out if you so please, or if you want to ask me about it, I'll tell you. Uh, but we can get a lot of information based on everything that we triage across the entire uh, host OS if you so please. Uh, so this is an example of that one that uh, Nick just showed from GitHub, ShareX, which is a pretty big project, does not have the assembly identity line inside of it, so this is an abusable project, can be deployed via a click once application. So this was us showing that that we can find it also with Assembly Hunter if it's installed on an endpoint. Another uh, one, so other ones that we found, uh, the one that we demoed, our third demo, uh, DF Monitor, this is essentially how we discovered it. We ran this across a host, we came across um, this one that has no application manifest in it, so that means that it is abusable for us to take advantage of. Here we have Chocolatey, it's a free one if you want to go and use it if you so please. Typically people download uh, projects or um, packages, repos um, for Windows. Some more Assembly Hunter usage. Uh, so this is just looking through the .NET Framework uh, directory, and so this highlights things that are important uh, for us to take note of when looking into uh, .NET assemblies. So the UAC setting, make sure it's as invoker or non-existent. Uh, the assembly manifest doesn't really make a difference because uh, we can pull all this information there. Uh, and then the no application I manifest identity needs to be either null or have no identity. Uh, and so these are all just, no, again, abusable things from .NET uh, framework that we can also deploy as well. Uh, at the bottom we have uh, CASPool, which is also part of .NET and not abusable because you can see the application identity uh, is existent there. So we cannot use that as a deployment uh, for click once. 
So we'll talk about some detection opportunities. Uh, so quick ones applications, uh, luckily, are not super common and this is going to be dependent on an environment. Uh, we've seen enterprise environments where they have 20,000 executions of click once a day based on DFSVC and we also see in other environments that have zero executions a day. So it's important to baseline here of uh, click once deployments inside of an environment to determine if it's actually something that's pretty commonly executed or not. Um, as we said before, DFSVC is going to be the process that spawns the entire or the handling of the entire deployment. So from everything from downloading, checking manifest, parsing and all that and execution, uh, whatever we are running, our application will be a trial process of DFSVC. DFSVC. So any sort of uh, non-common or non-expected child processes of that is something that can be keyed on. Uh, we can potentially whitelist uh, certain applications if we, if we use them in the environment. Um, that's some, an opportunity for us. Um, if we see DFSVC having a child process with an unsigned module load, uh, that is a pretty high indicator. Now we understand that this is not going to be inside of every environment that this can be, this type of telemetry is going to be leveraged or can be looked into, uh, but that for this technique at least uh, is a pretty uh, good way to catch this. Uh, in addition to that, dfshim.dll um, can also be used to launch um, deployments or downloads of a click once deployment. Uh, something we want to look into too, uh, ETW monitoring become increasingly uh, used by endpoint pr products and EDRs and such. Um, so if we look at uh, any sort of ETW information, uh, could potentially find malicious code execution. Something to keep in mind, uh, part of .NET configs, we can um, put an ETW enable flag in there and just call it make it false, uh, meaning that ETW will not be used in that particular uh, .NET applications process. Uh, so there is that and there's also public bypasses that exist for ETW as well. So it's something to keep in mind that uh, just because we're looking for ETW doesn't mean that there's not um, blind spots uh, in that. Uh, th as I said before, there's going to be download or every click once deployment is downloaded to the local app data directory. Uh, so if we baseline that directory, look for anything that is an outlier or non common, uh, something that we could find that was potentially uh, executed that we don't want. And then uncommon application signatures, making internet connections. So if we, uh, our first technique that we showed of backdooring existing uh, .NET application or uh, click once deployments, uh, a lot of them are not companies that you've probably ever heard of. And so executing this, uh, executing this in an environment, uh, you probably have an uncommon um, signature of an application that is now, you know, establishing C2 or doing something uh, nefarious. Some prevention opportunities. So we can deploy uh, registry settings across enterprise via GPO. Um, we have this uh, one that's um, at the for uh, prompting trust levels with click once. Uh, a few options that we can uh, set it to and zones that we can enable. So we have my computer, uh, local internet, trusted sites, internet, and untrusted sites. And so we can decide to, if we want to enable them, uh, make sure that authentic code is required or completely just outright disable it. If we do have any sort of application control deployed throughout the enterprise, then we also could look for unsigned applications uh, trying to, attempting to be loaded too. So this is just uh, an example of what it would look like if we disabled um, or had the registry key that says uh, disable internet. Um, so anything that comes from the internet, your, the users won't even have an opportunity to run it. It's just closed and that's it. All right. So yeah, in closing, uh, there's a lot of folks that uh, helped us work towards kind of uh, working through some of the technical details of finding these techniques. So uh, the first one that we wanted to give a shout out was our coworker Lee Christensen. Uh, he's done a lot of incredible uh, like offensive .NET work in general, and what we did would not have been possible without his prior work. Uh, another shout out we wanted to give was Casey Smith. He's done uh, also probably too much incredible work to name. Uh, one specifically that's ref relevant to a couple of the techniques we named, uh, app domain manager injection. He gave a phenomenal DerbyCon talk uh, that helped us a lot working towards these techniques. Uh, another one would be uh, William Burke gave a presentation on specifically the app ref MS stuff that we very briefly referenced during this presentation. Uh, he gave that presentation at Black Hat maybe two or three years ago and it really helped us. Uh, and lastly, uh, kind of in closing, there's still a gigantic attack surface associated with .NET in general, but even more specifically click once. Uh, there's plenty of areas to continue looking, uh, looking into and a lot of potential for more capability development. So thank you guys so much for coming. <laughs>
Thanks.